This is sponsored by the African Natural History Research Trust. Um, and I would first like to thank Michael Mankowski, our uh, harpist, for his very professional performance as an introduction to this event. give you some brief background about the manual project, uh, what our aims were and some of the constraints we dealt with during the production of Volume 3. I'll also use this as an opportunity to give an update on progress in the fourth and final volume of the series and talk about some of the problems with processing that volume too. So the Manual Act for Tropical Literature project was initially launched at ICD7 in Costa Rica in 2010 with the aim of producing identification keys and collating information on Afrotropical literature in a single affordable resource. The goal was to encourage a new generation of literatures both in Africa and elsewhere and to encourage interest in the Afrotropical form as a whole, especially amongst uh, practicing taxonomists. Final publication of the series would mean every fly occurring in the region could be identified to the genus level. The Afrotropical Manual was the first regional manual of its kind to use colour extensively, and each family chapter includes a colour frontispiece image, usually by Steve Marshall. Steve Marshall undertook expeditions to Tanzania, Namibia, Madagascar. South Africa and Mauritius, specifically to capture images for the manual. And Steve will be giving a talk um, after Adrian has given his, uh, his official launch. The use of colour in the manual also enables us to utilise modern digital, digital images of flies, rather than black and white images alone, such as this page of habitus images from the Muskie chapter from volume four, and this from the Rhino Forwarding chapter, also from chapter four. So after seven years of editorial work, volume one was published in 2017, which included 11 introductory chapters and identification keys to families, both adults and larvae. Notably, this volume included the user-friendly pictorial key to adult flies, which was specifically targeted at undergraduate level and for novices in the literature. Volume 2, also published in 2017, includes 43 chapters dealing with the Nematosphere Ditra and the Lower Kessel. Both volumes were officially launched at the special event held at ICD 9 in Winter Namibia in 2018. So, four years later, Volume 3, which is launched here, was published in late 2021 and includes 52 chapters dealing with Bacchisocyclorapa, excluding the Cuprata. All three published volumes are available as freely downloadable PDF files from our official website, maintained by the Natural History Museum of London. As the remit of our publishers, the South African National Biodiversity Institute, is to disseminate information on biodiversity the books are made available online immediately after publication of the hard copies. So, publication of Volume 3 was delayed for a number of reasons. Firstly, uh, the necessary disruption resulting from my move from South Africa to the UK in 2018 meant a break from my processing of chapters. After my move to the UK, we lost our graphics editor which meant I needed to clean images, construct plates, and add lines and labels myself, which also, of course, uh, took a lot more time. And then tragically, three of our chapter authors passed away during preparation of the volume, which meant co-authors needed to be found to deal with referees' comments and make the final changes to some of these chapters. In March 2019, the COVID pandemic struck which resulted in three months of furlough during which no official work could be done on the manual. Uh, 
Um, this also meant working from home, which had the advantage of, of my being able to spend um, more time on the manual, but also had the disadvantage of not being able to access collections and library facilities, not just for me, but also for the authors of chapters that needed to do so. So eventually the book was published in November 2021, towards the end of the COVID restrictions. We then experienced problems with the distribution of the hard copies, partly due to franking issues at Sandby, but also backlogs of parcels held up during lockdown and the irregularities of the South African postal system. This meant some authors did not receive their copies until one year later, which is obviously not what we were intending. So just to give you some details of um, Volume 3, to summarise the content of Volume 3, it covers 52 um, of 108 families of flies that occur in the region. Uh, it comprises over a thousand printed pages and includes 3,447 illustrations, 1,746 in colour, 108 black and white, and 1,609 drawings. To move on to volume four then, uh, this is now due for publication in 2024 and will include 12 chapters dealing with the Brachycera cytorapha. Steve's cover image here is South Africa's Tulkenbergai, which is endemic to Madagascar, and is, a, is, a, is fitting as the manual series is dedicated to the late Brian Stuckenberg. As far as progress with the processing of chapters is concerned, I will go through these superfamily by superfamily. So the Hippoboscoidia comprises two, fam two family chapters, the Glossinidae, which is now completed. When I say completed, I mean that the chapters um, had an initial edit, it's been through the review process, all the changes have been made, it's been typeset, and the uh, proofs have been signed off by the authors. Um, and the Hippoboscoidia chapter, which I've now set a final deadline for submission as December 2023. The Muscoidia comprises four families, the Scapophagidae, Anthemiidae, Phanidae and Muscidae, all of which are now completed. The Australia comprises six family chapters, and it's these families where there are the most problems. Only one chapter, the Ryan Horde, is completed. Two chapters, the California and Rinidae, really are pending, and three chapters have had final deadlines set for submission. I'll talk a bit more about the, uh, the California and Ryan Horde chapters now. So, um, to mention some of the specific problems we had, um, so the late kind of rock, rock nest was sold all along the California and Rinidae really chapters. Um, both these chapters require some major changes, and there is currently no expert on the agrotropical fauna. Some of the keys um, have been um, said to be too complicated by the referees, and many of the images need to have new, uh, new images captured. Another problem is the rec recently documented occurrence of the family Polyniidae in the agrotropical region. Given that the family was not at that time included in the Keys of Families Annals, which was published in Volume 1. First, the holoptic species, the Lenia pediculata, was discovered in Victoria, South Africa. And then the genus Marinia, with five agrotropical species, was transferred from the Rhinophoridae to the Polyniidae. It was not possible to allocate new chapter numbers for the Plinidae, as the chapter numbers have already been formalised and referred to numerous times in the earlier volumes. In the key to families adults, the genus Plinia, keys to California, and Marinia to Rhinophoridae, which means that the two genera of Plinidae need to be dealt with in two different chapters, none of which are specifically Plinidae. Yet another issue is the status of the Rhinophoridae as a distinct family, or as a subfamily of Caliphoridae as Rini Island. <coughs> so 
So many ideas of family was included in the key to families to adults in the world of wood, so it's retained as a separate family in the manual. And it's clear what's really needed is a combined morphological and molecular phylogeny uh, to better, uh, better tax on sample to finally resolve this issue. So it just remains for me to thank my co-editor, co Bradley Sinclair, for his meticulous final checking of the chapters. Uh, and he also was very, very good at uh, dissecting flies in his collection, looking at homologies and making sure that the authors had correctly labelled everything. And uh, without Brad, we really couldn't have done this project at all. Uh, secondly, our publishers, Sandy Publishing and Editing, the Natural History Museum of London, who maintain our website, the 53 chapter authors of volume three, the 70 reviewers of chapters for the volume, and lastly, I'd like to thank my sponsors who have both given us continuous support and also the Stringer Foundation, which is not just a logo. So thank you very much. We ask once again to contribute to the celebration of one of the miracles of modern publishing. And it is indeed a miracle not only for the physical production of this volume, but also for the information that it contains and the progress that it marks in the study of African dictology. To begin with, I want to say a few words about the changes in publishing and the changes in information retrieval that have taken place in the last half century. Those of you who were in Windhoek for the ICD may remember that I spoke about how the late Brian Stuckenberg had told me in the early 1960s that before he could begin work on any family predictor, he first had to ascertain how much, if any, of the relevant literature was present or even accessible in South Africa. This was before the days even of photocopying, and any literature required from the European or American library had to be photographed and then mailed to South Africa. If we go back a little further, <coughs> the 1950s when I first became interested in literature, the information that I needed from, say, general, general insectology, I had to copy it out by hand, and papers by mallet that I wanted to use, I borrowed from the library, typed out a copy, and traced the illustrations. In the 1960s, our manuscripts for publication were laboriously typed in duplicate, illustrations drawn, mounted on this board and numbered with left set, and then a bulk of package was sent off to an editor. Time-saving devices like electric typewriters and photocopiers arrived in the 1970s, and the first computers in the late 1970s. But even then, things were not so simple. When our Dictra group at the Natural History Museum in London was preparing the catalogue of the Dictra of the Afrotropical Region in the 1970s, we asked the museum's administration if we could use the single departmental computer to prepare the taxonomic index, but we told that that would be too complicated a task. So our typists typed out the entire catalog again. We sliced it up, each line was sliced up, alphabetically put into different boxes, and then each box was sorted alphabetically, the names pasted off the paper, and the poor typists typed out the whole lot again and sent off to the printer. But once personal computers arrived in the 1990s, manuscript preparation changed forever. And in the late 1990s, so did communication. When organizing the 1998 ICD in Oxford, all our preliminary announcements and registration forms were sent out by regular mail. But midway, midway through this process, emails took over, followed by the World Wide Web, and everything changed. It now became possible to prepare a typographically flawless and edited manuscript together with scanned illustrations embedded in the text and prepare review and publication to be completed within two weeks. It, is also, it has also become possible to access published papers by scanning the originals and then printing them out if needed or simply by downloading them from the internet. Resources like the Biodiversity Heritage Library have revolutionized the availability of old and rare books and journals. 
The catalogue of natural tropical, catalogue of the Ditra natural tropical region in 1980 was a landmark in the study of natural tropical Ditra because it brought together all the described species, assigning them as far as possible to their modern genera, outlining their distribution, and providing an exhaustive bibliography of all the relevant publications. Now, 40 years later, and as an absolutely bijou example of modern tradition, we have the Manual of Atrotropical Dictra, an outstanding collaboration under the direction of Ashley, Kirk Spriggs, and assisted by Bradley Sinclair. It summarizes the knowledge and expertise of some 115 taxonomists, which in itself is based on over 250 years of investigation into the Dictra of the African continent. So-called modern times began with Linnaeus in 1758, and most of the early collections of Dictra were formed by the doctors and naturalists who were attached to the early voyages of exploration, such as the Coquille, Ostrolab, Bougainville, Endeavour, Eugenia, Novara, and many others. These collections were usually made on the west coast of Africa, or more commonly at the Cape of Good Hope, which was the usual port of call for all voyages of exploration traveling to the far east of Europe in the days before the opening of the Suez Canal in 1869. As Europeans poured into Africa to settle and to exploit the abundant natural resources, large collections of insects made their way into the museums of England, Belgium, France, Germany, and even the USA, <coughs> where they were classified, identified, and described. An important part of this activity was to focus on the dicta of medical importance, such as mosquitoes, black flies, horse flies, taxi flies, and also on the dicta of pests of cultivated crops, such as fruit flies and shoot flies. We've now got to the point where it is a meaningful and important endeavor to bring all this knowledge together and to provide identification keys down to the genus group level that would enable the novice to find his or her way into the taxonomy of the dictra. Volume 3 is the third of four volumes, and like its predecessors, is an outstanding achievement on the part of all those concerned with the writing, editing, and production. It sets the bar so very high for all such manuals, whatever their geographic range. The scope of this volume was the families of the Ashiza and the Clitrata, and it includes the large and important families of Certidae, Tiflitidae, Chiropidae, and Platystomatidae. Authors are, for the most part, the leading world experts on their families. The quality of each family chapter is exceptional, and in addition to the keys to subfamilies, tribes, genera, all aspects of systematics, biology, practical importance are summarized. The editing by Ash and Brad is meticulous. In fact, I can say that my own short manuscript on the family Planeidae for Volume 4 was returned to me for revision or checking more times than the number of species that actually were used. So thank you, Ash. <laughs> Each chapter is embellished with photographs of living flies of an exceptional quality thanks to the skills of the field of Steve Marshall. Finally, we all need to acknowledge the publishers, the South African National Biodiversity Institute, who have produced a volume of such quality and at a price that is well within the reach of most interests, and the London Natural History Museum, which has made all these volumes freely available on their website. <coughs> One concluding thought, and thank you for your patience, I've been struck by the fact that of the 150 authors and co-authors involved in the four volumes of the manual, 87, or 76%, are middle-aged to elderly white men. <laughs> Defining young as anybody up to their mid-40s, only 17% can be classed as young. Only 9, or 77%, are women. And looking around this evening, I'm convinced that this kind of imbalance will soon be a thing of the past. Let us now hope that the publication of this manual will lead to an upsurge of interest among all entomologists and zoologists in Africa, both professional and citizen scientists of all nationalities, ages, and sex, and that the manual will be the stimulus for an exponential increase in our knowledge of the African dictator format. Thank you.
Leute zu zeigen, dass ich dann hier kein Nachgeber Präsentation erstellen muss. background prior to this project was entirely in the New World and Pacific. Uh, I had never been to Africa before, and uh, the, the, the concept of doing field work uh, primarily to take photographs was a novel concept for me. When, uh, yeah, as I, as I was saying, uh, my opportunity to participate in the manual as a photographer was a unique opportunity for me, because prior to participating in this project, I'd done a little bit of photography on the side while working in the New World and Pacific, uh, uh, primarily collecting vigorously to bring as many specimens home as possible. So uh, when, actually, let's see if this works this time. Oh, I've turned it off. There you go. See what I am having Just to... press the arrow. Press the arrow. Just not going. The first person who suggested that I might turn my field strategy around and put the photographer in front and center was Thomas Cable, who kindly invited me to uh, Tanzania in 2009 uh, and said, come to Africa, take photographs first, maybe do a bit of collecting on the side. Totally novel idea for me, but on we went to, to Tanzania and I, I quickly found myself uh, a big novice, never before in Africa, Africa knew me, up in the misty Mzungwa Mountains, uh, part of the, the famous Eastern Arc, the, the Sky Islands of East Africa. Uh, paradise. For me, I was like a kid in a candy shop. All of a sudden, I come from cold Canada, and I was here in this, this remote camp up in the Nzungwa Mountains with Thomas, one of my most esteemed colleagues, and a, a team of local assistants, even a cook. And I was surrounded by the most exotic uh, uh, pile of flies. Flies everywhere. That, that, for me, was paradise. And with nothing on my agenda but to take pictures in support of the manual. In the period of time we were at this camp, I took thousands of pictures. Digital photography was still relatively new at that time, so I just went crazy with the idea that every shot was free. And lots of sharp badges, of course, given the, uh, the company, but I was trying to shoot every possible family with the objective of providing the authors of the upcoming manual with lots of fodder from which they could select useful things for their, for their chapters. Oh, of course, I did a few things for myself, too. I work on micropieces. There's, there's a live uh, a, a holotype. But lots of cool things across the order. I was particularly delighted, personally, to see things live for the first time that I'd read about in Oldroyd's wonderful book, Natural History of Flies, which, which many of us uh, cut our teeth on as, as, as dipterists. And, oh, that's a giant land snail. It's not a fly. But if you look really closely in, in the mantle, uh, zoom in. Uh, those are Wandalekia, uh, a, 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 a forward specific to giant African landscapes. I read about that in the old way, so I was, I was totally thrilled by that. Well, Tanzania was exciting, fantastic success. Unfortunately for me, Ashley was of the same mind as Thomas uh, about the merit of, of bringing a fly photography in, into the field to work specifically in support of the manual. And, in 2012, he brought me to Namibia. Actually, Ashley and I had planned our first African trip when we met at the Brisbane Congress in 2002. And we put our heads together over many beer and planned a trip uh, to, to uh, collect more Mwamaya. And I wasn't able to make it on that trip. So this was my first time in the field with Ashley. And he is a force in the field, let me tell you. I know many of you have been in the field with him before and, and you've seen him in action. Uh, immediately upon arriving at a site, he puts out 
5,000 malaise traps. I don't know. <laughs> a lot of malaise traps. Uh, and after that's all done, he applies his camp skills as a, as a superb cook. You can see him here uh, making a cauldron of something in one of our camps in uh, the Caprivi Strip in northern, northern Namibia. And on top of all that work, once we're in the camp, and here's another one of our nice camps in the maybe very comfortable camp, uh, he is able to pin more material in one day than I've ever seen anybody pin in a week. Watching Ashley work yeah. and prepare material, sometimes under very primitive camp conditions, was, was astounding. And it, it, it sort of made me feel guilty about wanting, <laughs> while he was there working at all that pinning, I wanted to get my camera, look for flowers, and flies, and <laughs> I didn't feel too guilty. I had a really great time. But I've got to tell you, my experience doing photos for the manual was life changing. It was the best experience of my life. Just absolutely fantastic. And I, that's one of the reasons I, I, was, I, I gladly accepted uh, Ashley's request is to talk a bit about our, our, our experience collecting flies because I want to acknowledge the people that gave me that experience, uh, starting with Ash and Thomas and going on through. Uh, Daniel Whitmore uh, uh, helped us out and uh, participated in, the, in the, uh, the Namibia expedition and shared in some of our adventures. At that particular camp, for example, the camp owner had a, a, a beat up fiberglass boat. He told us as we were going up a river in his boat that the chunks out of the side of the boat were hippo bites. That was about 15 minutes before we got lodged on a sandbar. And he told Ashley and I to jump out of the boat and drag it off the sandbar. And uh, we did. I, I'm not sure. Daniel, you avoided jumping out of the boat. I don't remember this. <laughs> I remember. He stayed in the boat. But anyways, the Crocs and Hippos led us, led us along that time. And he was taking us up river to show us a, a, a giant uh, bit of sad carry and a, a poached uh, uh, elephant. And I remember I, that. I remember. You remember that? We, we collected for about an hour on that, uh, that carcass. Very sad, sad story about poaching. We only found one cosmopolitan species, Pyophyllum casei. So why am I bothering to include a picture of it in, in a talk about special laprotropical diptera? Well, I just really like this caption. Ashley brooding pugilistic pyophyllids on a ponderous, putrefying, poached pachyderm. There he is, pooting away. Uh, all right. Uh, there was also lots of uh, more typical Afrotropical diptera throughout our, our, our sites in, in Namibia. Literally thousands of photos. Uh, this was one of my favorites, the Congo floor maggot. Again, because I remembered it from my medical entomology course, and I'd never seen, you know, never seen it in, in the flesh as it were. So, Namibia, great success. Uh, Ashley, despite uh, having had to put up with me in, in Namibia for a few weeks, he still invited me to uh, the Western Cape in 2013, and he managed to time that trip for, for the peak floral period. Those of you who were at Cassandra's talk earlier today uh, saw some shots and heard about what a center of, of diversity the Western, Western Cape is. And this uh, distinguished gentleman up front is uh, Yu Shen Ang, who uh, uh, was uh, with us on, on that trip and uh, competently piloted, piloted our vehicle into all sorts of uh, wonderful places. Uh, these flowers, of course, were loaded with flies, but uh, we also managed to hit every, every little microhabitat that uh, uh, st uh, struck our fancy. And uh, Ashley managed to get us to some absolutely ridiculous habitats, because I wanted to shoot some thomaleids for, for Brad Sinclair. I think Brad described the species a little later, and that was one of many shots to show up in, in the manual. After doing that, the whole the trip went to hell. Uh, literally, and uh, Shen piloted us down this famously dangerous 48 kilometers down into Hell Valley, and uh, it was again phenomenal collecting. Uh, here's Yushin uh, with his head in the culvert, uh, dignified position as he's looking at a, an undescribed genus of, of Atheristic, uh, quite a quite a nice fly. And there's a cephalodromia from Hell. So. You know, we, we, we literally literally went to hell and back to get photographs for the manual, and it, and it was worth it. And after doing that, uh, the next trip in, in these, these wonderful adventures made possible by participation, participating in the manual, the next trip was Madagascar. And 
That trip was made possible by Mike Irwin. So thanks, Mike, wherever you are. Uh, Mike kindly invited me to come along on, on a trip there, specifically to take pictures for the manual. And shortly before the trip, unfortunately, he had to pull out. But fortunately, uh, he was able to invite Ashley to, to come in his place. Uh, and we were able to tie up with uh, Rhea and Arcala here, the most fantastic diptorist uh, uh, in Madagascar, possibly one of the best in the world, is a, a fantastic field biologist and, and uh, a, a great guy. And uh, Rita took us around Madagascar, took us to great sites. And I, I know I've said this about a number of, of collecting trips, but this was the greatest trip of my life. Madagascar, I, I, I mean, I dreamed about going to Madagascar for, for many, many years, and I'm sure all of you as, as diptorists, as, as, as biologists, are aware of, of what a special culture of diversity Madagascar is. And for a dipterist, Madagascar is incredible because the flies there are, are, are so different, yet so the same. It, 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 the things you're surrounded by are always seem to be something really special. Like the, the things that are rare elsewhere seem to be common there, and the things that are really rare elsewhere just seem to show up. So for example, uh, these are a few shots of flies on the, on the same trail that, that actually had blocked by one of his Malay straps, so I had to climb under his ropes with all my camera equipment. But uh, the, within meters of that Malay strap, uh, we found the, the endemic Malagasy Nurekita near Texas, down in the lower right, we found Nebula, the uh, uh, minutes, which I'd never been able to find before. I spent a lot of time trying to find Nemo in Australia, never find them. Uh, uh, stay, it's not that rare. And Marginus, one of two families I failed to get for the manual, and that's a dead specimen. I stole it out of, out of uh, Ashley's malaise trap. <laughs> I gave it back to him. But I never found a live, a live Marginus, but I found lots of other great stuff. Even the Spirocerids were pretty in Madagascar. And you know, that's, that's my main group, Spirocerida, and I don't normally photograph them because they're small and ugly. But in Madagascar, even the, even the Spirocerids were, were great, and the Micropatients were incredible, another group. That, that's, that's the one family I did a chapter for, for the manual. And this is a, an endemic genus, Stiltissima. Look at the stilts on that, that body. I actually sunk that genus after and put it in Paramembrala. But on that trip, I found a dozen new species of Paramemigrala, the endemic genus, and photographed them. It's just gorgeous, like almost everything in Madagascar. So Madagascar, best trip of my life. Probably two, 3,000 photos. That's all I can show you is, is a few in our, in, our, in, our, in our minutes today. Now let's go back the same year, but the year, 2014, back to South Africa, uh, where I got to participate in uh, a very large expedition uh, uh, organized by Ashley and and, uh, uh, and, and Vaughn here. Um, I don't know how they managed to organize a, a tent-based expedition for this many people. It had to be like herding cats, but they pulled it off uh, and uh, we did uh, a couple of major sites in Kwazulu Natal, uh, uh, Royal Natal National Park, and most importantly, uh, uh, Nidumo. Uh, the large game reserve very close to the Mozambique border. Uh, the, the Dumo was phenomenal collecting for me. Oh, and I, 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 Daniel, Daniel Whitmore there, and that looks like Sean Winterton wanted to go along with that. Sean must be here somewhere. Uh, they left a few flies for me to photograph. They didn't, they didn't kill them all with those, uh, those wicked weapons they're carrying. Uh, <laughs> Again, thousands and thousands of, of uh, photos, which were, were called, sent out to, to all the authors, uh, and many uh, uh, were approved and used for front species or, or parts of the manual. At this point, we were also looking actively for photos to use in, in, the, in the color key for the, for the, uh, for the manual. And you know, I, I, I deliberately didn't spend any time today boring you with, the, with an explanation of why color is important for the manual, because if, if you use the key or thumb through the, the chapters, you, you realize that they, they make a huge difference to the identification and appreciation of Afrotopical diptera. So we were looking not just for, for front of species, we were looking for close-ups and things to, to make flies easier to identify. Uh, so there's just a few random 
uh, shots from, from the jungle, <laughs> including the, the famous, infamous uh, uh, Marley Maya, the holotype that got away and led to a whole bunch of that stuff. But I'm not going to talk more about that. Instead, we'll look at, at, at actual elephant shit, uh, which, which, is, uh, which is up here. And I'm, I'm not moonlighting as a coleopterist in, in this picture taken by Ashley on my 16th birthday, by the way. Uh, and later that day, he made me a cake. I told you, guys a great, great cook as well as a great collector. But I'm actually photographing a kleptoparasitic Spirocerus seropterum. Uh, so, the last expedition. I said I'd go through this very quickly, and I, I think I, I did pretty fast. Sadly, the last trip I, I, I made to Africa in support of the manual was was to Mauritius, and that was an exciting trip for me because I had special things I wanted to get there, a whole subfamily of, of uh, Micropisidae, which isn't elsewhere in, in the Afrotropics, and that ended up uh, as, a, as a new genus, and a few other special Micropisids. And lastly, the key to Mauritius that ended up as the frontispiece, uh, uh, or as the cover shot for the volume three that we're celebrating today. So, we turn to celebrating. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Steve, for that very entertaining talk. So that's kind of the end of the talk, so you must just now uh, eat, drink, and be merry. Uh, if anybody here has not seen the manual, I'll I'll leave a copy at the front and you're welcome to come through and page through. Thank you everybody, enjoy yourselves.